called this uh, sermon Answers to Our Gospel Doubts. And up until this point, we're now in a new chapter of Romans, but uh, Paul has kind of been outlining for his audience the gospel. And he's been explaining to them that it's actually not based on what you have been practicing with the law. The law is, it instead was intended to outline for us the standard that God expected, which was perfection, an impossible standard for us to live up to. And Paul is really good about it, and he's answering objections while he's writing. And this is uh, one of those such passages in Romans 5 where uh, Paul is actually answering some objections that he anticipates people bring up in response to what he has just said uh, in previous chapters. So, one of the questions that, after you read through this passage, um, that you're, you may be left with, including maybe the, the previous chapters, is, do you know that you have eternal life? Many of these people who would have been listening to Paul were hearing new things that they hadn't considered before. These were brand new concepts that they had completely misunderstood their Old Testament. That they had thought that the law was what allowed their entrance into the kingdom of God. And now Paul was saying, actually by faith that you are saved. Your trust in God and His ability to provide a way into heaven for you is what allows you into heaven to reconciliation with God. So now the question is, do you know, actually, that we are reconciled? And there's an emphasis on, on no. We, we may know, actually, that we're reconciled because of what Scripture says. But sometimes I feel like we can walk through life doubting. Maybe we don't doubt God and His power and ability to save us, but we, we doubt our standing in front of Him. Maybe we haven't done repentance just right. Or maybe we think that we've repented and trusted in Him, but our fruit uh, has not added up to what we've seen in Scripture. But yet we read verses like this in 1 John 5.13. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. It's not it possible to actually know or just be very hopeful for eternal life. We have seasons of strong faith and we climb these spiritual mountains. Sometimes we go to conferences or if you're in youth uh, ministry, you may go to camps or mission trips over the summer. And we have these spiritual peaks where we just feel like we are so close to God. And then we come back and it, it starts to taper away and, and fade and, and we start to kind of feel like we're back in that valley where we haven't opened our word in, in days or, or weeks or we haven't been in our and pray life with our Father. And so many times that can cause us to doubt. We have doubts that spring up and, and sometimes we don't know how to answer them. Or sometimes we just suppress them and then forget about them. And then they come up later even stronger. So my, my purpose in preaching this morning is to help you live with confidence that is firmly rooted in Christ. And to give you a place in Scripture to turn to, to know when you're playing again with these doubts about the gospel, that you can turn to and see your true standing in God's eyes. So, in this text here this morning that we just read, Romans 5 1 through 11, you see Paul address three doubts about the efficacy of the gospel. And I have them here for you that you can read briefly, but we'll go into detail for each of them. The three doubts about the efficacy of the gospel. The first doubt here is, is more of a question about God himself. What is the truth to know that I'm saved? Can you also ask, how do I know that what God is saying is true about himself? And then the second two, the other two doubts here are more related to ourselves. I'm looking at my own, my own life and what's adding up to what I'm reading in Scripture, and I'm just not straight. So we're going to look at these is free and detail. The first one here is, what is the proof to know that I am saved? How do I know that what God is, is saying to me is, is true? And we're going to look at the first two verses 
and then we're going to skip down to verse 5. Uh, because, as you'll see here, there's actually a very strong Trinitarian work here in Romans 5. All very good about um, including all three persons of the Godhead in his writings that he used here as well. So look with me here in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then skip to verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So one of the first proofs to know that we are saved is that the Trinity worked for our salvation through the work of the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Verses 1 and 2 were immediately confronted with a therefore calling us back to the previous chapter and the previous verses. And if you glance through these verses here in chapter 4, we read actually a, a summary of how Abraham was saved through his faith, not through his work. And that's what we talked about last week, that Abraham himself believed God and there was not doubting within him, so that he put his full faith and trust in God because the work was finished. And so we have a therefore for us to recall that and look ahead now. And we learn that God justifies someone based on their faith and trust in Him and not our own ability. That's what we've been hearing for several weeks in a row now. But if we're to believe in, in Christ's finished work on the cross and trust that God is truthful in His promise to save us, then we too are justified, just like Abraham. And then we see that Paul is assuming that we do believe. He says, the phrasing is really specific. He says, since we have been justified, or some translations say, having been justified. And this phrasing indicates a, a finished reality. It's, it's done. It was a moment in time and it's, and it's finished. There, there doesn't need to be any more work to do in the future. Justification is a, a one-time event. We talk about the Christian life in terms of an ongoing process of improvement. That is a whole different matter. That is after the moment of justification, our sanctification works. Christ's work is finished. As he called out himself on the cross, John 1930, he, he said so himself. And it indicates two things for us if Christ's work is finished. First, that you don't have to maintain it. If it is finished, there's no work to continue to do. And secondly, you don't lose it. If you could lose it, then his work would have to be redone. But it's finished. And secondly, in verse 1, we learn that our justification, which is finished, accomplishes peace through Jesus. But as we flow through verse 2, our peace with God means that we have obtained, meaning we didn't have it before, but we've now obtained access by faith into the grace and peace, and we know that we have hope, which leads to rejoicing. So there's a lot of key words in here that we can unpack, and we won't spend too much time on this one point, but it really is the main kind of key to the whole section, it's even these opening verses about the work of the Son. So we talked about justified once and for all. But this idea also is peace with God. Harkens back to the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 3 24 says that God drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that, that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. When Adam and Eve were in the, in the garden, one of their roles was to watch and work the garden. Watch implying guarding, guarding from evil. Adam should have killed the snake. That was his role. And now, since they fell and failed to do the role that God gave them, God replaced them. He passed them out of the garden, 
we put a chair of in place to watch the garden instead. But if man tried to enter back into the garden, then the cherubim who had a flaming sword would stop him. It's not a very good picture of peace with God. It's not a reconciliation there. And so this is a, a way of explaining that actually now, through Christ and his work, there is peace. We can look forward to entering that garden again. And you see this theme of, of progressively reaching God and reconciling with him through Scripture. The next book is the Exodus 28. We see that garments are, are described for the priest who would be working around the tabernacle. They had to wear special clothes, and they had to dress themselves in a special way once a year to go into the Holy of Holies. They had to sacrifice for the, the people, and they were only allowed certain clothes and certain ways of, of walking through the Holy of Holies, or else they would see death. Still not a great picture of peace, but at least there's something. But now, we stand in this grace, as it says here. We get to walk through the Holy of Holies because of Christ. And he's allowed us to. John 6, 37 says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And so we have this idea of permanence. So not only uh, can we walk into the Holy of Holies, but we can stay there. In the Old Testament, it was just a, a one-day-a-year occasion. And now we have a permanent place in the presence of God. And then finally, as we look through these first two verses, we have a hope that has been given a reason to rejoice. Titus 1, 1 through 2 says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, this is him opening the letter, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages to come. There's a difference between a hope as in, I really hope I can get this, this, this eternal life, and a hope that is looking forward with, with a sure, with a sure, knowing that it will be place. So these are our first two verses here that the Son's work is finished for us. And now we look down to verse 5. And first we see that the Father's love is manifested to us. The beginning of verse 5, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. Christ works to make it possible through Him. We are granted access to the Father. We have further proof in the work of the Father here that His love is poured into our hearts very generously. One of the ways that we can know as proof that we are saved is that we now have a different way of viewing people. That we can view people through the lens of loving them and seeking their good instead of competing with them. That we can show mercy to them. That evidence that God's love has been manifested to us through this pouring into our hearts. John, 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because He first loved us. The evidence that we love like God is, is evidence that God has poured His love into us. And this kind of love is, I mentioned just now, sacrificial, that's vulnerable, and that God knows us and reveals Himself to us. It's humble, it's not self serving. And this type of love is further fleshed out if we read verses 6 through 8. For while we're still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for the righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's this love that is, is that, it's sacrificial, even without payment back. 
might say that this, this love is poured generously. We don't have that in the text, but we know from the attributes of God that this love must be generous. Because God is the source of this love. He defines what love is. If God doesn't have love, he himself is love. And so he can give this love generously because he himself is infinite in love. And so we're kind of a, a hose that is attached to this infinite water source. And if we detach from the source, our hose dries up because we have no source anymore. But in God's great multitude, our love can flow out of, out of His goodness. So that's our second proof. The Father Himself is working. The Son works. His work is finished. The Father works in providing us Himself. And how does He do that? That's the third point here, the Spirit. The Spirit's presence within us. The end of verse 5. God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. There's a lot of confusion sometimes about the Trinity, that how can there be three persons who are all the same God, um, and we talk about them separately, but somehow they're inseparable. What, what, how does that work? Well, I don't have all the answers for this, but we see here that God, in His Trinitarian way, works the same work in us, which is reconciliation and salvation, through the three persons in unique ways. And here He pours His love into us as evidenced by the Spirit, the Spirit's work. And now we have an indwelling Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Very, uh, it's very important to think of Him as a person and not a force. Luke 24, 49, Jesus promises the Spirit. He says, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. So stay in the city until you're filled with power from on high. In John 14, 16, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Helper, this is a, a per, person language. So what is the role of the Spirit in our lives? We have, great, we have a, a, the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. That's a great thing to think about. But how does that affect actually how I, how I live my life? If I'm saved by God and I need to see fruit, how is the Spirit going to help me? Well, we see this is the verse we just read. The helper, there's a, there's a, a real sense where he gives us power to accomplish what God has willed for our lives. We see in Ephesians 1 that he seals us until the day of redemption. This is a guarantee of salvation. So Christ's work is finished. God proves through his love that is poured into our hearts, but then the Spirit seals us and makes sure that we're kept until the day of salvation, that even if we falter and fail, that we'll always return to him. The Spirit assists in prayer as an intercessor according to the will of God, Romans 8. That's a, a wonderful passage that we'll get to later this year, but that oftentimes we don't know what to pray, and we have the words that just aren't adequate, and the Spirit Himself prays for us, gives us the words to say. And in Scripture, we see that the prayer of a righteous man is answered. And so how much more effective are the prayers of the Holy Spirit for us? The Spirit baptizes the believer into a new birth. This is the, the baptism of, of fire that undergoes a purification. Romans 6. The Spirit comforts believers. First Thessalonians 1. He sanctifies believers. Galatians 5. This is the fruit of the Spirit here. The Spirit bestows believers with unique gifting for the body of Christ. So we get our spiritual gift, and then we can go and serve our church because of how the Spirit has gifted and equipped us. The Spirit convicts unbelievers towards Repentance. That's John 16, 8 and 15, 26. We don't come to repentance on our own. We're spiritually dead. And so the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and gives us the ability to repent. The Holy Spirit restrains sin in some cases. Second Thessalonians 2, 6 through 10 is an example of sometimes we don't we are not as evil as we could be. 
That's the restraining power of the Spirit. And lastly here, he gives wisdom to believers. First Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. When we pray for wisdom, wisdom is kind of a, an idea of discerning good from evil. Making wise decisions is a moral act less, um, less than it is what of knowledge, and the Spirit provides us that wisdom. So, I say all these things to say the entire Trinity, the God Himself, in three persons, in complete unity for the sake of, is working for the sake of your salvation, do you think that you've slipped from the fingers of God? Sometimes it's hard to believe that God actually cares and loves us, but when we read here in the, in the scripture, there's all three persons present working together for your sake. You say God is lying, or that you're beyond his strength. So this particular doubt is a doubt about God himself. We come by it with learning more about him, becoming more familiar with him and the doctrine of of God and the Trinity and His work and His love. But I would argue perhaps that more of us today suffer with these other two doubts. At least for me growing up, I never really doubted God that He existed or that He was all good and all loving and all powerful. It, it seemed kind of self evident to me that. If love existed, there must be a perfect example of it. If uh, kindness or, or if justice existed, there must be a perfect manifestation of that somewhere. And it must be in God. That, that was kind of what I always knew about. And so my doubts were always surrounded by my own capabilities and uh, what I was experiencing in my own life. I wasn't seeing fruit in some seasons, and I, I wasn't understanding the purpose of suffering. And so maybe you have a doubt like, like this. If I have been saved, then why do I suffer? So we're going to look here at verse 3 and 4. Read it with me here. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Here is it's this idea that suffering is expected. Paul just addresses it as though everyone knows what it is. But that's true, right? We became Christians, and we still have lives that are involved with financial stress and physical ailments and death, and we still deal with sin. And so it's equally true. Christ is really bringing his kingdom to earth, and, and if we belong to him and we're co-heirs with him, and have the Spirit in us, then why do we still suffer? Yeah, maybe we have small moments where we stub our toe, and, and, um, and we have small moments throughout the day that uh, happen to everyone, but then we have these massive problems coming up in our lives when God is supposed to be for us. This is a huge barrier for many unbelievers to come into Christ, this, this idea of suffering. And what we see in Scripture is that suffering is expected. It's just first point here. Suffering is expected. It's a theme throughout Scripture. In fact, in the New Testament, it seems to increase in how it's being addressed. That the writers of Scripture not only say, speak of suffering as something of a reality of the world, but in fact that our suffering increases when we become Christians. And, and Christ addresses this. And some of them out at the very end of his opening words, he says, That blessed are you when they persecute you for my name's sake, and they will insult at you. We, we see in Scripture that suffering is just a reality of life that is expected. But our religion sometimes seems to not embrace that. Instead, we, we kind of seek this uh, different type of religion that. Um, tends to improve our lives, either physically or financially, or avoid and minimize any suffering that could possibly happen in our lives. And I'm not saying it's, it's bad to pursue fixes to our problems. In fact, God's given us grace to uh, use medical inventions and 
uh, and find good colleges to go to and, and good careers. But I'm afraid that sometimes that feeds into how we believe God expects us to live. That we have this, this idea in our culture called moralistic uh, therapeutic Judaism. I mean, you may have heard of that, but if you're not familiar, it, it kind of views man's role as the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. It's kind of this idea that you can't help others until you yourself are in a place that is healthy and good and, and whole. You see language like wholeness and, and whole person care and uh, self care and love yourself and follow your heart. And our purpose is very me centered when we believe this thing. And this phrase that is more like a therapeutic deism, it, it's an actual uh, concept, it's an actual worldview. Some people believe it without even knowing that it is a worldview because it's so pervasive, especially in our American churches. But do we see something based on how it advances our happiness and our comfort, or do we see something? based on how it advances our godliness. In this worldview here, it, it believes our role is to be happy, feel good about ourselves, be friends with God, but God's role is that He does not need to be particularly involved in our lives, except when He's needed to resolve a problem. And God is only necessary to fix problems. And so when we see, when we think of that concept and pair it with suffering, as we see in Scripture, we don't really see the connection between why we belong in Christ yet we suffer. Suffering is something to be avoided. It's not a, a thing to to be sanctified by. So not only is suffering to be expected. The suffering is intentional. There's a, a testing involved with it. Paul gives a reason for our suffering. We don't know why we specifically suffer. There's some people who have much heavier weights to bear than others. And we don't know why God allows for one person to suffer in a much more extreme condition than others. Or why some wicked people seem not to suffer at all. But we do know that there are spiritual benefits to suffering. For one, there's endurance that we gain from suffering. There's a a definition I like. It it says endurance is an ability to remain under tremendous weight and pressure without succumbing. That there's this, this weight, this heavy weight dragging you down because of your firm footedness in Christ. You remain standing. James one twelve says, "Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him." Endurance is something that we undergo now, so that when Christ brings us final rest, we can see the goodness in it so much more. Suffering also produces character, a recognition of the right role of man and, and the role of God. It's, it's proof of your Christian character. So, for example, I had a, a professor even this semester tell a quick story about how he spent uh, nine months overseas in a country by himself. He was unmarried, uh, and he spent that time uh, learning. And I think what he said was, in those nine months, he had been able to read like three massive volumes that he was wanting to read. He taught himself Greek. Uh, he taught himself Latin. And he said, man, I was feeling at the top of my game when I got home. He said, one of the negatives was that he could only email home once a week, um, and he didn't have a lot of contact with the missionary that he was, he was with. So he was really isolated. But then he said he got home, and everything changed when he got married. And he realized that he wasn't as holy as he thought he was. Yet he had taught himself biblical languages, and he had read theological volumes, and he had 
read through several, the Bible several times. That was another thing I forgot to mention. We read through the Old Testament three times and the New Testament five times in his mind. And he said he felt so holy. And he got home, he got married, and realized that his isolation meant that he could do whatever he wanted on his own time. There was not a testing involved. And a second person in his life with, with different goals and different aspirations and different opinions caused him to have to guide himself several times. And he said that our testing is what proves our character. I wasn't as holy as I thought I was because I wasn't forced to prove it. My suffering had not gone far enough. Suffering also produces hope. And I'm just reading from our scripture. And this is in endurance, character, hope. Hope is the recognition that the role of God makes future glory and purity, as we mentioned earlier. That we don't look ahead with uneasiness, but we look ahead knowing that God does not lie and that He's promised something good for us. And finally, number four, rejoicing in our suffering aids our witness. So suffering produces rejoicing, and this rejoicing is in our suffering. We rejoice because we suffer, and it aids our witness. There's a couple verses from Habakkuk here that says, from 3, 17 through 19, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the field yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes my knee tread on high places. If we undergo suffering and we keep, we keep a heart like what we just read in, in Habakkuk, think of what that could do for your witness with your co workers or with your um, unbelieving family members going through severe trials, yet remaining steadfast and rejoicing in what they're teaching you. It's, it's quite a strong witness for the hope of the gospel. And there's a third doubt that Paul addresses here in the final verses. Uh, how can God say someone so rebellious like me? There's, there's this question of, I, I think this it is too bad to be saved. I've given my life to Christ in the past, but there's fruit that I'm seeing that I'm not liking. I'm still wrestling with this one sin that I can't seem to put away. I don't think my repentance was genuine if I'm seeing these things or if I'm still struggling with sin. I don't think God really knows just how bad I am. Let's read verse 6. You don't have to read it with me, but I can just read it here. But it says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It says, While we were still weak. Christ didn't look ahead into the future and see a moment where you wouldn't be weak and said, Okay, I think, I think he's passed kind of a threshold where I can, I can now reach in and, and save him. But no, he, while we were still sinning, while we were still uttering persons at his name. He saved us. He chose us before we ever had any inkling to grieve and repent for nailing him to that tree. And also see in verse 6 it says, at the right time. At the right time he did this. Meaning, this was planned. This was the moment in time that God planned from eternity past. It's a predetermined moment that Christ was to die. It was not a plan B. Let me read a, a quick section from John 19. Pilate speaking with Christ. This is 9 through 11 in, in John 19. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? 
do the same for him. You would have no authority over me at all. I'm glad that God has been given to you from above. I recently heard it in, a, in another message, but uh, Pilate here is saying, there's a script here, this is what the teacher says, but the script here, you can see you're not following me. I have the power to release you. Just bow before me, beg for your life, I don't see. I don't see any reason to execute you, but there's a crowd of your guards. Do you renounce the claims that they're making on you? And Jesus says, "I don't you actually only have authority that was given to you, and it was given to you by." So this was a choice by God. God chose to save you. It wasn't that he was obligated to. It wasn't that you slipped up and he thought, oh man, now I have to include Tonto's name on this list as well. But that he chose to save you from the beginning. Secondly, God saved you at your worst. Verses 7 through 8. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would bury them to die. But God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So there's a second emphasis that we were ongoing sinners. We were we were early influenced at him while he was dying on the cross for us. He saved us at our worst. We were spitting in his face like those mocking him on the cross. Think of our, our movies today. I think it kind of desensitizes us to this idea and concept of sacrificial death and, and dying for one another. Um, I think recently, I don't know if it's, if it's a, a whole um, history of movies thing, but I think it's recently, there seems to be a trend where the, the main hero or uh, the franchise star dies, sacrifices him or herself, and then the franchise brings them back. Maybe it's a money grab. Uh, that's one of my least favorite aspects of our movies today because it really, it, it shallows and, and really desensitizes us to the sheer sacrifice of dying for one another. We don't get to actually look into the ugliness of, of death. And even more so, many times in our movies, there's, there's sacrificial death for the team members sacrificial death for a lover, but I don't know the last time I saw a sacrificial death for on behalf of the wicked person who was antagonizing um, everyone on, on, in the movie or in the story. It's not really a theme that we, we know well as people because it's scandalous. It, it doesn't seem to make sense. But while we were wicked, while we were the antagonist, Christ died for us. Christ died for you as you are at your absolute worst. You're not going to scare him off with your ungodliness. Christ values a broken spirit and he despises the ones who keep it all together for the sake of appearances. It's better for you to be open and show your ugliness to Christ and repent of it and give it up to him than it is to put on an appearance and look like an obedient Christian and try to do all the right things. If you're hiding in the dark, fearful of what might happen, if you expose your sin, he's not Christ is actually already aware. He's already aware of the sin. And he chose to die to forgive the sin. He can't out sin his grace. And then finally, our last point for this morning. How can God say someone so rebellious as me? Well, God not only saves, but he keeps you safe. Final verses here. Says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. There's a truth to the importance of the resurrection and how we can sometimes forget it. 
because of how dramatic the death on the cross was, how ugly it was. But without the resurrection, everything that we read in our in our Bibles is, is worthless. And Paul outlines that in First Corinthians 15. So if you're ever curious about the implications of the resurrection in our life, go read that chapter, First Corinthians 15. Um, it's, a, it's a really good defense for why the resurrection matters. But if Christ could save us in his death from the sins that we commit, how much more so did his resurrection and his life and him currently sitting at the right hand of the Father, how much more so can that save us? How much more so can he hold back the wrath of God in our lives and walk with us? We have a conclusion here that I want to just talk through a little bit because this one, this perception is about doubting. Doubts don't mean that you have no faith. Growing up, I was told doubting is good and having doubts is good. I think what it's actually meant by that phrase is having questions and wanting to know the why is good. Wanting to ask, how is it that Christ dying as one man covers the sin of all men? How is that possible? But I wouldn't classify that in what is being talked about here with doubts. Doubts doesn't mean you have no faith, but it is evidence of a momentarily weakened faith. We see an example that's pretty. Uh, clear to us, it's a, it's a good picture of it. In Matthew 14, 31, when Peter walks on the water to meet Christ, and there's a moment where he, his eyes turn away from Jesus, and he falters, and, and he starts going under. And Jesus reaches out his hand and grabs him, but he also gives a light rebuke to Peter for his weakened faith. And so we know Peter is he belongs to Christ, but that he had a moment of a lack of his faith. And so that can tell us something. I think it does tell us that doubts need to be addressed and they need to be repented from. Doubts themselves are not from God. God doesn't want us to doubt. He wants us to trust. If you look back in, in the uh, fourth chapter that I just mentioned at the beginning, uh, Abraham believed and trusted God and there's actually, the wording in there is that there was no doubt in him. That's the type of faith God wants. He doesn't want us to have one foot in and one foot out. And I have this verse here for us to kind of explain this a little bit, that there is indeed a cost to be doubted. Not all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials are very tough. Here's that language again. It's for sure a thing. You will meet trials. But you try to joy, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that steadfastness has its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, and give generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea and is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Doubt is the lack of trust in God, and yet we all deal with it. And I mentioned earlier that some of us just suppress it, we don't address it. Maybe we don't know how to deal with it. And maybe we just assume that it's the normal part of our Christian life. And so, if doubts come up, we just push them away and say, I don't want to deal with that. I'm still going to be doubting. Maybe we feel shame for the doubt. Maybe you have doubts about things like the reliability of Scripture or the possibility of the miracles that you're reading. Or that helping God have a personal relationship with me, a mere human. Does God really actually care about my inner thoughts? Or, here's one, did God see what that person did to me? I've been hurt by someone. And I'm not really getting the justice that I deserve. Does God care about that? 
you know, examples of doubt that I'm sure at some point in your life you've had or maybe you're currently dealing with. And so I just wanted to give us three tips here for expelling doubts. We're always going to have them. They're always going to come up. That's just our weakness in the mystery. But as we grow in sanctification and trust in God, we can learn to begin to expel them faster and in a more biblical way. And the first one here is to capture the doubt. We don't just want to suppress it or deflect it, but we want to grab hold onto it. Second Corinthians 10 5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We take thoughts captive, we capture them, we hold on to them, and we address them with what? The truth. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Our doubts are a lack of faith in the knowledge of God. We must take hold of them and address them, or else they'll come back stronger and with more evidence against us. Sometimes we're afraid to deal with it because it's ugly. Many of us have the experience of getting getting a text back from you and you're not confident in it. And so you just kind of hold it away and you keep that to score. Uh, you kind of cringe a little bit. Or maybe we just made a big purchase and there's a little bit of buyer's remorse and we're feeling a little bit shaky about checking our bank account after that. The phrase like, what's the damage is used sometimes. It's because we don't like looking at what is ugly and it's full with glory. It's hard, but we have to take it captive. Or else, as the verse we just read in, in James, we're tossed to and fro. We're like waves that just hold on to some sort of hope. Um, maybe we have a teacher on YouTube that we're listening to, and they say one thing, and it sounds really good. But then we continue looking at another teacher on YouTube, and it sounds really good. Or uh, we go to a couple different churches throughout the week um, on Sunday, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening, or Wednesday night, and we're just looking for something that seems good enough to hold on to, while all at the same time ignoring what is written in our word and and not addressing our doubts with truth. The second part is that we need to pray a two-part prayer. There's a prayer of repentance, as I mentioned, because doubt is not from the Lord. The sensation of doubt is not from God. James 1.13 says so, that God does not tempt his people into sin. But, again, doubt doesn't mean you have no faith. It does mean that your faith is faulty to some degree. And Jesus himself rightly rebukes his disciples for their lack of doubt. Jesus is also gentle with his disciples. And he does rebuke them, but he gives them the strength to believe. He explains himself to them. And Jesus wants you to return to him. He wants you to know that your doubt is not from him. But that it is okay to address that doubt and to come to him and be renewed and refreshed and given the wisdom to, to overcome it. So that's the first part, re- repentance. And then the second part is a, re- a request for faith. You should echo the words of the man in Mark 9, 24, who even his daughter healed. He came to Christ and, and Christ, uh, he said to him, I believe. And then he said, but help my unbelief. It's a recognition that we believe and we trust in Christ, and yet there's still lingering doubts that we need prayer to overcome. We can't fight it on our own. And then our third point, our third tip is, is to pursue wisdom. How will we be able to overcome doubts and prepare ourselves to overcome more in the future? Well, we need to be equipped. We can't just be sitting ducks, ready to be shot out of the water. A couple quotes about wisdom here. John Alvin says, A man speaks with more or less wisdom according as he has made more or less progress in the knowledge of Scripture. Alvin, and, and I agree with him, has such a strong 
focus on the importance of the Word of God because God Himself is wisdom. He's the source and He's revealed Himself and all that we need to know regarding faith and wisdom and Scripture. And Augustine says, the conditions of wisdom are not so much intellectual as they are moral. So it's not just how much we know, but it is our ability to discern. When we look at the events in the world today, are we able to see how God would have us respond to them? Or are we reactive? Do we see world events and we feel emotions coming up in, our, in ourselves, or we want to rant about something, or we uh, take positions immediately because uh, of some sort of political meaning that we have? Or are we able to discern what is getting in there? Are we able to make an argument for it? Or are we just following whatever next headline happens? Wisdom and discernment promotes flourishing. God himself is the source of life. What he wants for us is that we ourselves find life and flourishing and eventually total healing in the new kingdom. And so our wisdom would say we want to choose what God's will is because He's the source of these things. James 1 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. When we pray, we pray without doubt that God Himself is the source of wisdom and that He desires to give us wisdom. And then Romans 12 2, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern or have wisdom to know what is the will of God. <clears throat> what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So if we have that mindset, if we capture those, those doubts, and they pack them with what we know about the knowledge of God, and we, we repent of these doubts, and we request for more faith, and we request for more wisdom, God is faithful to give. He's merciful to forgive us, and He's faithful and generous to give. So I just encourage you, if you're struggling with doubts currently, you're not alone. You follow every single person who's ever been born. And that God desires for you to be back into His fold with confidence. Mm-hmm.